Ladies and gentlemen, I know there's a lot of frustration of late concerning discrete GPU market. You could say there's a bit of a black cloud hanging overhead, but I do think that there is some great cause for optimism. Not only are AMD and Nvidia pumping out some great budget options in the future for their current generation GPUs, I'll talk more about that in uh, a future video, but also we have some excellent APUs coming out from both AMD and of course Intel's own iGPUs are going to be significantly upgraded as well. In this video then, I want to talk with you guys a lot about Strix Point because it's shaping up to be absolutely phenomenal, essentially making low-end GPUs all but irrelevant. And as a bit of a bonus, I also want to discuss PS5 Slim. A couple of my sources have been discussing this with me, and it seems that there are some significant changes over the launch models. Perhaps one of the ones that's raising my eyebrow the most is that the liquid metal is no longer going to be used. So let's start things out with Strix Point, shall we? Now, AMD themselves have already confirmed this in a roadmap, so there's nothing new here in terms of the code name. They've confirmed that it's Zen 5. RDNA 3 Plus as well as AIE. Now RDNA 3 Plus one of the big changes is optimization for power and lower uh, so lower power consumption higher clock frequencies and we'll get why this is actually important in just a moment. So it is a big little design and the high performance cores are going to be 8 Zen 5 cores. For those who have missed this I think that Zen 5 is actually 8 cores per CCX anyway and I believe that it's a 25% IPC gain on average. This is over Zen 4. So that is quite a significant uptick. So I assume that that's going to be single thread, um, those numbers, that's what I was told so far. So average workload, single thread is 25% faster than Zen 4. We may see a small increase in clock frequency. It's probably not gonna be a huge increase because Zen 3 to Zen 4 just pushed the boat out just it well i didn't even push the boat out it like it actually designed the boat then pushed it out then sailed around the world with it in terms of the clock speed uptick um as for the igpu which is perhaps the thing that i think is going to be interesting to most of you 24 compute units that's 12 work group processors that's the current target now this number could change before release but so far multiple sources have told me 24 is what they're aiming for along with three gigahertz for its rumored clock frequency remember again this is rdna 3 plus so there are some changes in the design to increase the um clock frequency i personally i'm taking that with an asterisk i've actually heard higher than this but um i'm going to be very pessimistic right now and i'm going to say uh three gigahertz i've actually heard um several hundred megahertz higher could actually be achieved but i'm going to be quite pessimistic especially after amd failed to hit their clock frequency targets with n31 so i'm going to say three gigahertz now i've also been told that infinity cache is used but it's not quite clear to me whether that's all variants or just one specific flagship or whether that's untrue i think it is accurate i've been told different figures one source told me it's 32 megabytes and that would actually be quite significant given how Narve 33 actually has just 32 megabytes of infinity cache. So perhaps they will cut this down um, towards launch and obviously it's also going to support very fast LPDDR5 memory as well. So if these performance targets are reached, we'll have a minimum of a 9 TFLOP GPU, probably higher. And uh, this is basically going to mean that lower tier GPUs from AMD and of course nvidia and even to a degree intel themselves are going to be essentially just useless they're going to be irrelevant unless you're buying them for either a different machine or whether you're just kind of you know you just need one for like a very specific purpose but for gamers who are on a budget this actually would make some really just it could make a really nice little mini form factor system and it will also be i assume doing absolute gangbusters on things like um you know laptops and that type of thing this will actually put a ton of pressure on nvidia because obviously yes cards like the rtx 1490 sell extremely well but as most of you know cards like the 60 and 50 class are typically the cards that sell in the highest volume so i think that this is going to be an absolutely amazing architecture i'm extremely excited to see what amd brings forth with this um as most of you know 
uh, AMD's been putting a lot of pressure at the moment on Intel in terms of their CPUs, especially on the server side. It's going to be very interesting to see what actually occurs, I think, in terms of the desktop. But um, yeah, let's move over to the PlayStation 5 Slim, shall we? Now, there's been a lot of rumors concerning a PS5 Slim model. And let's just be honest, guys, we all know that there will be a Slim of the console. There have been cost-reduced consoles since essentially, you know, dinosaurs ruled the earth. The PlayStation 1, hell, even the, you know, the, 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 the NES had a bloody cost-reduced system. So this is just standard stuff that happens within the industry. Now, as far as I am aware, the launch date is this year. In fact, we've already seen this kind of teased by Sony. To be very, very, very clear, the specifications are not changed. So there's not going to be, let's say, additional RAM. There's not going to be upticks in GPU performance. It's going to perform the same. So basically speaking, within margin of error, if you were to put a game in and you were to do a frame rate test on, let's say, title on a PS5 launch versus this, they would perform identical. Now, Insider Gaming have already leaked that this system exists, including the fact that it will have a removable slash external disk drive. And this seems to be true. It basically connects what I believe is via a USB port. I'm actually hearing that this drive is going to cost under 100 US dollars. It's probably around 80, maybe cheaper. But the, the kicker is if you have a digital edition PS5 now, you cannot buy this drive and then quote unquote upgrade your system. So you cannot simply use this drive on the PS5 for whatever reason. I don't know why. I don't know whether it's just Sony being Sony and being kind of mean, but I think it is probably more a technical reason. Perhaps they've got like an additional controller or something else. It's gonna be interesting to kind of do a deep dive when this actually launches, but Either way, multiple people have told me that it is not usable on the newer systems. I would love for this to be incorrect, but that's what I'm told so far. Now, the console itself will obviously, A, be significantly smaller because, well, it's slim, so that's not really, you know, surprising, but it will also run significantly cooler and be significantly cheaper to manufacture. This means, of course, that in theory, Sony could put a quite aggressive price discount on the PS5. Now, there will be a plethora of changes. Basically, there will be a major rework of the motherboard's PCB and various components. Again, that's pretty standard affairs for a slim revision. But I'm also told, and perhaps one of the key differences here, is that it will utilize traditional TIM or thermal interface material. It will not use liquid metal. So that's kind of interesting because liquid metal, so during the Road to PS5 event, Mark Sony did mention the liquid metal and it was also shown during a breakdown of the console itself. There have been some reports that liquid metal has actually started to leak in some consoles, especially if it's in the vertical position. But personally speaking, and from what you know, the reports have stated online, I don't think this is like a case of oh, being vertical caused the problem. I think it's just like, it failed. That's the problem. So in other words, it's just the console itself was faulty or whatever. And again, when we're talking about, you know, a console failure rate, unless we actually have a specific number. So for example, a report from, let's say, a console repair guy is not really telling us the console repair, sorry, the console defect rate, because we don't know the percentage of consoles that are being returned, like, you know, there's 30 million or whatever PS5s that are currently in the wild, probably a little more at this point. So it's like, you know, some repair guy getting a PS5 here or a PS5 there. It's just pretty standard stuff. I'm not defending Sony. I'm just saying that without knowing the number, without them publicly stating the number of consoles, the, the, the defect rate, and Sony haven't done this, Nintendo haven't done this, Microsoft haven't done this, to my knowledge, this doesn't really matter, but either way, it will be significantly cheaper to produce a console which does not utilize the liquid metal, because basically speaking, you can just kind of cut back on the cooler itself and all of the other bits and bobs that go around with it. It's just a lot simpler to design the, 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 the cooling system. Now, I think the process used is 5NM. The redesigned console, which was just more recently released, is 6NM. The debut system was 7NM, so I think the Slim is using 5. Another source told me it's 4, but frankly, I am very skeptical it's 4NM. But I'm mentioning it for the sake of completeness, 
but so far I do think it's 5nm. Now for those wondering, because inevitably I'll be asked otherwise, the PlayStation 5 Pro is still in development according to multiple sources that I've spoken to, as is a souped-up Xbox. They gave me a lot of information in these same sources on various PC hardware releases that turned out to be quite accurate. So I do think that we are looking at a PS5 um, Pro which is still in development. I would say that this console is going to be quite a significant uptick in performance over the debut system. In fact, there is some public quote-unquote evidence. Um, there is actually a small update concerning the PS5 Pro, so some of you may recall a patent which was discovered last year from Mark Cerny, who of course is the lead engineer slash architect of the PS5, as well as the PS4 and other consoles. And you can see on screen the patent itself. Now, I believe that this is much close to how RDNA 3 or later handles ray tracing. And I think that almost certainly, if a refresh happens for both Microsoft's console and Sony's console, it'll almost certainly use some type of hybrid design of RDNA 3 or even RDNA 4, because let's just be honest, guys, it just doesn't make sense for them just to go with RDNA 2 again and then just like bump up the, let's say, number of ALU. There's probably going to be a significant change in architecture. We saw that, of course, Microsoft really pushed this with the Scorpio. They, they went from, you know an older design to like a Polaris based design. Sony did the same with the PS4 Pro. In fact, they even went slightly above that. They went with like some type of weird ass custom design with some elements of Vega. Um, I think Vega, the, the biggest thing they pulled in was the um, RPM, Rapid Pack Math, which is half precision floating point operations. So this basically means if you have um, a full precision operation, that's FP32, um, you can basically run one of those on an ALU at a time as a floating point operation. Um, whereas FP16, which you can use for certain things, like Sony used it a lot for checkerboard rendering, I think. And you can do it for other things as well, because some, some applications just also, some tasks don't, need, don't use high precision operations, F, full precision, uh, FP32. So you can use like half precision float and you can basically execute two of them simultaneously. Um, so that obviously does improve performance. There were some reports that that meant that the, you know, the PS4 Pro was like, you know, double the FP, <laughs> FP performance, but uh, that's not quite how it works because most of the time it's obviously running um, FP32 commands, but I'm going a little bit on a tangent here. Uh, so yeah, it's going to be very interesting to see what the next generation, or shall I say the upgraded generation consoles are going to bring to the table. I think that they're going to be significantly higher. I've already mentioned that I think the PS5 Pro is targeting a two times increase minimum and possibly even two and a half to three times in ray tracing over the base console. This is pretty close to what they did previously. I think the PS, this is from memory, so if I'm wrong on this, sorry, but I think it was like 2.25 times faster than the base PS4, the PS4 Pro. And obviously Microsoft just went absolutely bananas with the uh, Xbox One X, like Project Scorpio, which is absolutely crazy. One of the big problems with the PS4 Pro is it was very memory bandwidth limited, and you could definitely kind of figure this out at some point or another. That's not to say Project Scorpio was like perfect. It didn't have the FP16, but it had crap tons as a technical term of memory bandwidth, and it also had a lot and I do mean a lot of compute. It had like six T flops, which for the time was kind of just, just bonkers. So it's gonna be very interesting to see what occurs. I think this is gonna be very, very important going forward because yeah, um, let's just say I think PS5, uh, sorry, PS VR is gonna really benefit from this. With that said, guys, um, I've gone way over the uh, attended length of this video. Take care of yourselves. Have an amazing day. Bye for now.